So now you have to endure another hour and a half of me. <laughs> uh, I'll, uh, the, this, in this hour and a half or hour and 20 minutes, I'll try uh, to give you general comments of where I believe this field might go in the next uh, years. Uh, this might be completely wrong, but it's, I, I'll give you some facts which are definitely true and they might be interesting and they might play a pivotal role in the developments in this field in the future. It's not guaranteed that this will be the picture when the dust settles down. <coughs> so uh, first, of course, uh, from two, three, and four dimensions, which I've covered rather meticulously, uh, there is an obvious uh, guess, which is that in d-dimensional field theory, So in d-dimensional field theory, the candidate for the quantity that will decrease monotonically is the partition function on SD. Yes, the log of the partition, the mi minus the log of the partition function on SD. In D, when D is even, uh, that would be the coefficient of the logarithm uh, of the radius. When D is odd, that would be just this finite guy F, analogous to this finite guy F in the three dimensions. So that's the candidate in any number of dimensions. And I'll start by giving you something that I've promised in the very first lecture. I'll explain why this is a good quantity to study and why it passes some basic sanity checks. The basic sanity check is that suppose you have a conformal field theory and suppose this conformal field theory has an exactly marginal operator. We have many such examples. For instance, n equals 4 Young mills theory has an exactly marginal operator, which is the gauge coupling. So the theory is conformal for every gauge coupling, unlike UCD, which of course runs. N equals 4 is conformal for every gauge coupling, and you get the manifold. In general, there is a manifold of conformal field theories. It's an ordinary manifold. You can understand the geometry in this manifold. There is a metric on this manifold. So sometimes people call this the conformal manifold. So in general, when you have exactly marginal operators, you have a conformal manifold. And amusingly, there are even patches. You sort of need to introduce patches on this manifold sometimes, because what you call a mar exactly marginal operator in some vicinity might cease to make sense in another region of parameter space and there it's called something else. So this is a really, this is a genuine manifold. There is a manifold structure on the space of CFTs which are connected by uh, exactly marginal operators. Uh, if there is supersymmetry, then this manifold has extra structure in it. For instance, if it's n equals one, then this manifold is scalar. In two dimensions, if it's, n, if it's two comma two supersymmetry, it might be even special geometry. So there is, uh, in n equals two, in four dimensions, it might be hyperkeller. So there is a lot of structure on such manifolds. Uh, and one basic consistency check uh, for any proposal for a quantity that decreases monotonically is that it has to be constant on this manifold. So this function minus log zsd has to be a constant on this manifold. It cannot be a function, because if it were a function, it would be very easy to violate the conjecture by going from one point to another. And there is a very simple argument that shows that it's a constant. I'll now go through this argument. So let's pick a point on this manifold, uh, uh, which is some conformal field theory. Let's pick this point. We can call this conformal field theory zero. And we can study the derivative uh, with respect to this uh, coordinate lambda. So what are the coordinates on this manifold? These are the coefficients of exactly marginal operators. So we can study the derivative of log of the partition function uh, at uh, lambda equals to zero. Okay, so we studied the first derivative of the partition function at lambda equals to zero. That would show, that if that is zero, that would show that this log is uh, extremized for this conformal field theory, but because this conformal field theory is chosen arbitrarily, uh, if I prove that this is zero, then it shows that this function is constant everywhere because the first derivative is vanishing everywhere, okay? So what is the lambda of log of zsd at lambda equals to zero? Uh, when you start from this CFT to probe this vicinity, you add exactly marginal operators with coefficient lambda. So the first derivative is the first derivative of the log is the one point function uh, of this exactly marginal operator in the CFT lambda equals to zero, where, la was, where O is an exactly marginal operator. Is that clear? It's a, of course, it's an expectation value on the sphere. So it's an expectation value on the sphere. So it's a one-point function, an integrated one-point function on the sphere uh, of an exactly marginal operator. 
Are there any questions about this? Okay, that's uh, almost by definition true. Uh, so what do we do with that? In general, uh, that could be some power of the radius. If you just use dimensional analysis, that's of no avail because it could be some power of the radius, which uh, is non-zero. The trick is that to realize uh, that this is what's special about the sphere. This is why the sphere is, plays such a prominent role in any number of dimensions, because the sphere, as I already mentioned many, many times, it's uh, stereographically equivalent to flat space. This is why the sphere is so special. It's the only, well, I might say something wrong, but I think it's true as a, mathematics theor as a theorem in mathematics. I think that the sphere is the only compact manifold which is conformal to flat space, which can be obtained from flat space by a, a conformal transformation. Not the only conformal manifold to flat space, of course, but it's the only, manifold, the only compact manifold which be, can be obtained from flat space by a conformal transformation. I believe this theorem might even be right. Uh, and since this is the only manifold which is compact and can be obtained from flat space by a conformal transformation, this is a natural object of study because you can define the partition function on it. It has no volume divergence, so it's a very natural object to define for conformal filters. So using this conformal map, because this is a primary operator, so now I'm starting to use the properties of this operator O. Because it's an exactly marginal operator, it must be primary. Because if it were not primary, you could uh, get, there would be something which is a total derivative, and you could get rid of it because it doesn't affect the partition function. So that can be, without loss of generality, interpreted to be as a primary operator. And then you'd use a conformal map. Now I'm using a conformal map. We use a conformal map, and the, we get a one-point function in flat space of O, <coughs> integrated over the whole volume. So basically, we have a one-point function in flat space with lambda equals to zero. So this is a one-point function in a flat space. In in flat, this is a one-point function in flat space in a conformal filter is specified by taking this coupling lambda to be zero. What do we know about one-point functions of uh, primary operators in flat space in a conformal filter? In general, they are non-zero, but in a conformal filter, they must be zero by dimensional analysis because there is no scale in flat space. So while on the sphere it looked confusing, this, con this one-point function could have been some power of the radius of the sphere. By doing this conformal map, it's clear that this one-point function actually must vanish because there is no candidate to write on the right-hand side. There is no scale in a conformal filter and O is of dimension four. This is another point where I'm using the fact that it's not the unit operator, for instance. It's an operator of non-zero dimension. So this must be zero. Okay, this shows that the first derivative of the log of the partition function over the sphere is zero at every point on the conformal manifold, which then establishes its, constants, its constancy. Right? So therefore, this is a constant on conformal manifolds, and it's a pretty unique quantity that has such a nice property. It's not true for the free energy. There is the famous three over four. So if you take n equals four super young mills theory at weak coupling, there is a certain free energy and a strong coupling, which is connected to it by an exactly marginal operator. You get the famous three over four. So the free <coughs> energy is not constant on conformal manifolds, but this object is constant because of this magic that this is the only conformal manifold which can be obtained from flat space by a coordinate transformation. No, uh, this one, uh, conformal coordinate transformation, yes. Sorry. Is this a proof just about the local structure? Or can no, uh, since it's true at every point, it, establish, it shows that this is a constant function. So you could, this log of ZSD could, may, a priori, it may not have been a function. It, it, could be, it could have been some weight on the manifold, but it turns out to be a scalar function on the manifold, not something with a weight. Uh, and it turns out to be extra mite at every point, which means that it's constant. Okay, so this is why I think this uh, uh, sphere partition function ap appears so ubiquitously everywhere. Um, and well, that, that, that makes it sort of the most natural candidate from this point of view at least. Are there any questions about this argument? Now I'm switching gears to a completely new topic, entanglement entropy. Now, so I'll explain what is entanglement entropy now. There is a lot of activity in this field in condensed matter systems nowadays, which I'm slightly ignorant of, but I have seen that there are many papers. People discuss uh, topological phases 
And apparently entanglement entropy is the order parameter for some topological phases, and there is a lot of discussion. I can uh, send you to some reviews in condensed matter about this topic. There are many, many papers. <coughs> uh, now I'll explain what it is, and I'll try to define it in quantum field theory, and then I'll explain morally why it's the same as A in four dimensions, the same as F in three dimensions, and the same as C in two dimensions. <coughs> Chosen appropriately. So, a, a qu so now I'll just discuss qu quantum mechanics for a few minutes because I need to define a few concepts from quantum mechanics and information theory. So suppose you have some quantum system which is completely closed. A closed quantum system with no environment, no decoherence. Such quantum systems are described by a wave function, psi. In this case, we say that this quantum system is in a pure state. We know what's the wave function, and we can calculate the expectation values of operators by, switching, by sandwiching them between the, states, between the state of this quantum system psi. Okay? This is uh, the, pre the predictive power of, quant of uh, quantum mechanics. More interesting is to consider uh, systems which are in a mixed phase, uh, not in a pure state, in a mixed state. Uh, what it means is that uh, you have, well, one way to think about a mixed, a mixed uh, phase, one conceptual way which is easy, is to think that you have a lot of closed systems which have nothing to do with each other, many, many copies of some closed system, and somebody decided to play a prank on you and prepare them in different pure states, which you don't a priori know. So this could be in a pure state psi 1, this could be in a pure state psi 2, this could be in a pure state psi 3, psi 4, and so on, and it goes forever. In principle, there could be many, many systems with, in different pure states just because somebody decided to play and prank on you and prepare them in different pure states. What do you do in this case? In this case, you cannot, if you want to calculate expectation values of operators, you don't a priori know uh, with which system you're going. You'd, so if you did this experiment again and again with the different systems, you'll find that you get different expectations. Well, it doesn't converge because there are many, many, many sides. But you can restore the predictive power in this case if you uh, say that uh, you know, it's, there is a probability P1 that the system will be in the state Psi1, probability P2 that it will be in the state Psi2, P3 that it will be in this state, P4 in this state, and then you can make uh, probabilistic, pr probabilistic statements, right? So in this case, it's natural to define the so-called density matrix, uh, which is given by, it's a matrix, in the Hilbert space of, the, of a single system, which is given by the sum over Pj, uh, Psi j, so this is the definition for the density matrix. And using this density matrix, you can make probabilistic claims about such a setup where the system is in a mixed phase, where you don't a priori know what's the pure state of the system. What with which wave function to describe the system. So if you have an operator O, you can calculate now its expectation value in this slightly generalized quantum setup, and instead of dotting it, sandwiching it between the state psi, now you just weigh, you, you just take into account all the possible states and you uh, give weights pj to the cor corresponding wave functions. So one finds, so one way to write the answer is trace rho of O, okay? So you trace over all you take some basis in the Hilbert space and you trace. <coughs> Rho is now this matrix, <coughs> and it's clear why this describes the right answer. When you open this trace, then you get expectation values of O in these states psi j, respectively, but weighted with probability pj. Okay? So this is how you calculate a expectation, <coughs> values, expectation values in a mixed, mixed phase. Now, for example, when you turn on temperature in quantum field theory, you don't know in which pure, pure state your system is at every moment. So the correct way to describe finite temperature in quantum field theory is with a density matrix. There is some probability that you're in some state, and then you just use the, you use the density matrix uh, for this. You do use the density matrix for this, for, for this system. Now, when the system is in the mixed phase, there is some entropy associated to it, unlike the systems which are in the pure phase. In the mixed phase, uh, there is some information somehow stored in this uh, system, and one can define the so-called von Neumann entropy. There are other entropies in, that people use in information theory, like Rainy entropies and so on, but I'll be using the von Neumann entropy, which has many, many nice properties. 
so if you study information theory, there is a list of seven properties which the von Neumann entropy satisfies, which fix it uniquely. So there are no other uh, entropies that satisfy the same nice properties as the von Neumann entropy. And the formula is just minus pj log pj. Okay? So given a mixed phase, you do the sum, which you can also write as uh, minus trace of rho log rho. So given given a, given a mixed phase, you can do this. You can calculate this quantity s, and uh, you can determine the entropy associated to this mixed phase. Yes. I don't know. This is what they, how they call it. <laughs> uh, they call it the von Neumann entropy, literally. I, I, I have no idea why. Hmm? The engineers call it Shannon. The who? The engineers. The engineers call it Shannon. One is information theory, one is policy. I have no idea, but uh, it's, it's called von Neumann entropy in the, <laughs> in the references that I've looked at. So, a. Uh, <coughs> Now, there is a specific application of this uh, density matrix that we will need uh, for quantum field theory, but it can be defined first without quantum field theory. So suppose there is a system, so of course in this, uh, things are important in black hole physics and so on. Uh, in general, it's important when you have a large system, which is artificially divided to two. So there is a large system which I'll call AB. It's divided into A and B. And you can define some density matrix for this setup where the system is, is divided artificially into A and B, and assuming that the Hilbert space is the tensor product of A and B. So all you assume is that you have some large system, which I call AB, and you assume that the Hilbert space is given by the tensor product of states in A and states in B. You just assume this tensor product structure for the Hilbert space. Okay? In that case, the wave function for the state and you, the wave function for the state AB uh, is pure. You can even assume it's pure. Yes? Can you say something about this assumption? I mean, no, it's just, uh, so far it's just mathematical, uh, mathematical introduction. You assume that you have two decoupled systems. You assume that you have two decoupled systems, A and B, and they form one large Hilbert space, AB. In this Hilbert space, in this large Hilbert space, there is, of course, the famous phenomenon of entanglement. The states could look like, uh, of course, the states would look like uh, psi tensor phi or something where this sits in A and this sits in B. So in the, the states could be correlated in this, in this case, right? There could be a correlation between the state of B and the state of A via entanglement. Let's assume that the density matrix of the large system is called rho AB. So rho AB describes the density matrix of the big system. It may be even a pure state and then the density matrix is trivial. It's just the product of psi, psi without any probabilities. But it, let's, I'll leave some room for rho AB to be non-trivial. So that's the density matrix of the big system. And now you can define what the information theory is called a reduced density matrix by integrating over the states of B. So you just write rho A equals trace of B, rho AB. This defines the, the so-called reduced density matrix. Uh, one, thing about, uh, one thing about this guy is that even if the state of the pure system, sorry, if the state of the large system is pure, namely that the large system does not carry any entropy, it's in a pure state, once you integrate over the states in B because of entanglement, you may generate a non-zero entropy associated to the, density, to the reduced density matrix rho A. Just because of entanglement, you can create entropy out of the blue, okay, by integrating over the states in B. Is that clear? Okay. So uh, this reduced density matrix is what I will use now in quantum field theory. So now I'll try to embed 
I'll, f I'll try to forcefully embed this concept in quantum field theory, although it may not look very natural in, first in the first glance. So in quantum field theory, we have the vacuum. Quantum field theory at zero temperature is described by a vacuum. And I should mention now that uh, the way I'll force, to I'll force to embed this kind of concepts in quantum field theory is by imagining uh, that the whole system is in a pure phase. So I'll imagine that the whole system AB is in a pure phase so that the density matrix of the big system is trivial and then I'll integrate over something. You could also discuss quantum field theory in finite temperature and then the density matrix for the whole state would be non-trivial and it would be slightly more complicated. But let's imagine quantum field theory which, is, which lives in infinite space and it's in the vacuum. So quantum field theory is in a pure state. The density matrix of a quantum field theory in the vacuum is just that. Okay, it's a pure state, there are no probabilities, and quantum field theory at zero temperature carries zero entropy. No temperature is just a pure state, so there is no entropy. It's a unique vacuum. Now what you do is that you have your, uh, so this is quantum field theory in R d plus one dimensions, right? So it's, if d is equal to three, then it's R4. So you consider quantum field theory in d plus one dimensions, where this is rd comma one. And now what you do is you look at the space-like slices at zero time. So let's take time to be zero. Then we have d-dimensional space-like slices. And we divide this, so this is like a d-dimensional space-like slice. And we pick some uh, finite region inside this uh, zero time slice, which we call A. And then we define a trace over B, where B is the complementary of A. So this is B, and B is equal to A complementary, such that B union with A, they don't intersect, except for along the boundary, and B union A is the whole space. So we trace over B the density matrix of the vacuum. So we construct a reduced density matrix, in other words, a, which is associated, which is associated to this contour A, row A, okay? So this defines a density matrix at zero temperature in quantum field theory. Defines is a stretch. We have to discuss whether this thing makes any sense whatsoever. And I'll try to explain that it does make sense now. There are some divergences, but uh, one can classify them. And I'll explain how they look like. So the, but this is the definition. The, the, whole, the, whole quant the whole state is in the pure state, but then you integrate out B and you get A. Now, notice that Matan's, yes? Matan's question was why, I mean, this construction relies on the tensor product structure of the Hilbert space. So here, I'm invoking a bit of, uh, I mean, one has to invoke a bit of, uh, what, what, one, one, one has to have a leap of, invoke a leap of faith, I guess, a bit. Uh, and one has to believe that since uh, all the points in A and B are space-like separated, uh, these are, this correspond to the mutually diagonalizable operators. So one can choose a basis in quantum field theory such that somehow the abstract Hilbert space of quantum field theory is given by the operators in B tensored with the operators in A. So this is an underlying assumption behind all this business. But it makes sense because these are space-like separated so they commute and you can imagine that there is a huge basis of operators uh, where everything commutes and you can associate a basis of states which are localized outside of A and inside of A. Yeah, I don't think that's mm -hmm. That's right. But in the lattice theory, it's obvious. Theory, it's obvious. It's obvious that yes. the basis of Hilbert space is a tensor product. Yes, yes, indeed, indeed. But there are also operators in that. That's completely space. true. That's completely true. So that isn't a requirement. Uh, you know, you can have kinetic pressure. That's right. It's not. It's it's a. It's not required that operators are local in A and B. Right. Operators could be non-local. There could be Wilson lines that traverse through A and B. What is required is that there is a way that the Hilbert space is really tensor product. And if you think about the lattice limit, it's obvious. Well, so, oh, this is the Hilbert space. This is not the Hamiltonian, indeed. 
Did I say Hamiltonian? Okay, then I'm sorry. No, this was always the Hilbert space, that H is HA tensor HB, and then I traced over the Hilbert space. This is a statement, this is the Hilbert space, yes? H Hilbert space, whatever. <laughs> yes, this, this was, of course, uh, what I also meant here when I traced over the Hilbert spaces. So one has to assume that the Hilbert space takes this tensor product form, but this uh, is obvious if you believe in the lattice limit. You can imagine that some field theories don't have a lattice limit, then what do you do? I think it's still conceivable that this is true by, by the fact that operators commute at a space like separated points. Yes? This is t equals zero slice. I'm taking the t equals zero slice, and I'm, this is just some you know, space-like slice of quantum field theory. <coughs> everything is space-like separated from everything. Oh. You can even write formally the Hilbert space of quantum field theory as an infinite product of all the points. You just divide it into small lattices, and you write it as an infinite product. I think if you if you build, if you are optimistic enough, then you can write this, such equations. I don't know what axiomatists would say about such equations, but I think it makes sense. Okay, so you, given that the Hilbert space has a natural tensor structure associated to it for, that is inherited from the lattice limit, if there is a lattice limit, you can define the de reduced density matrix over any region, as a, well, which has an arbitrary contour. Now, the problem in quantum field theory, unlike information theory, is that we have a continuum of degrees of freedom. There are really infinitely many degrees of freedom in any finite chunk of volume in quantum field theory. So one has to worry whether this thing is actually divergent and uh, ill-defined. I'll now tell you what uh, is known about the divergences of uh, this density matrix in quantum field theory. Uh, Yes, B is non-compact. B is non-compact, so the density matrix is defined for A. I should note, however, a small theorem in information theory. So suppose you have this large system AB, and suppose you trace over B the density matrix of AB. Then you get the reduced density matrix for A. Now there is a theorem that if the entropy associated to the big system is zero, meaning if the big system is in a pure state, then it's row A is equal to row B. So the reduced density matrices of A and B are equal. You can try to prove it as a small algebra exercise. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, the entropies are equal, of course. You can try to, yeah, it follows from the, well, a, a hint is that the row AB is the tensor product of A and B. This is a, a property of the density matrices. So if you use this equation, you can arrive at this conclusion. If row AB uh, is a, Zero, if, if the entropy of pro A, B is zero, okay? So in fact, it doesn't matter whether I define it for A or B, they're equal, formally, if this limit exists. <clears throat> okay, so now what is known about uh, this entanglement entropy? Um, so, pro of A, so one cannot really prove rigorously what's going on but people have computed entanglement entropy on the lattice. They've taken the continuum limit, and also there are some uh, analytic computations for free scalar fields, and some maybe slightly more uh, dramatic modifications of uh, uh, scalar fields. <coughs> and the, what they found is that uh, basically, since this is a space-like slice, and uh, all the interactions in quantum field theory are near neighbor, near neighbors' interactions, so if you define some renormalizable theory, you have two types of interactions in quantum field theory. Interactions which are strictly localized to one point, like potential terms, phi cubed, phi four, or interactions which have derivatives, like d phi squared. Interactions which have derivative, derivatives generate entanglement between points which are infinitesimally close. All the, interac all, all the interactions are near ne nearest neighbor interactions in QFT in some sense, so you have some entanglement between these guys. So divergences, divergences, seem to correspond uh, to points which lie infinites infinitesimally close to this boundary. So all the divergences associated to this entanglement entropy are really associated to the boundary of this region. Okay? That's also kind of obvious from the lattice limit, that once you start uh, refining your lattice and making the lattice spacing smaller and smaller, you would create huge 
entanglement across points which are near the boundary, and the whole thing is jeopardized. Uh, maybe the whole thing would blow up. So rho A in quantum field theory is believed to take the following form. So now that you have this UV sensitivity, it's obviously not a good limit in the continuum. There is some divergence. But like this partition function in three dimensions, you'll see that there is some piece which is scheme-independent scheme eventually. So the entanglement entropy does induce a quantity which is associated to the continuum theory. But the first few parts, the first few terms are divergent. So the first thing is that there is a volume divergence. So there is, if, you, if you denote lambda uv to be the cutoff, the first thing that you find is lambda uv to the power uh, d times the volume of a, the volume of the boundary of a. So we get d minus 1. D minus 1. Yes. So uh, the area of the a or the volume of the a, whatever. You can call it the area of the a if you want. So this is a fascinating equation. And many people who are interested in black hole physics tried to make a lot of use of it because you get the scaling, area scaling law. Okay? So the entanglement entropy in quantum field theory has a divergence. It's, it's clearly a crappy quantity because it's, the, you've, it's sensitive to the short scale physics, but it's an area law. And people believe that this uh, has some relation to the Bekenstein Hawking formula where it induces some quantum field theoretic corrections to the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. I don't uh, want to discuss that because it's beyond the development of my lectures. Yeah. Oh, again, yes, yes, it's S. This is S. Yes, I'll, I'll mention that. But from the quantum field theory point of view, you could imagine that there is a black hole and there are some quantum fields sitting around the black hole. And you could imagine that there is some entanglement between the quantum fields inside the black hole and outside of the black hole. And then such a correction, people believe, can, should be taken into account when you study the entropy of black holes or whatever. So there are many papers about it. I don't know if this actually makes perfect sense. Yes. This is the von Neumann entropy. Yeah, this is the usual entropy. If you take a thermal ensemble. Yes, then the von Neumann, if you take a thermal ensemble, the von Neumann entropy is the, log, is the derivative of the partition function with respect to beta, which is the usual entropy, the usual thermodynamic formula that you learned in undergrad. So uh, this is the first term. This is not the only divergence, just from dimensional analysis, it's conceivable that there will be lower divergences. There are no longer volume divergences. So they're associated to some length scales. So then there's another term, like lambda uv, d minus 3, and then some length scale associated to the boundary. So let me denote it LDA. This is some length scale associated to the boundary. It's no longer the area. Only the leading term is the area. And this is the to raised to the power 3 minus d. And the, so on and so forth. And then eventually, you hit the finite piece. Depending on the number of dimensions, if you are in four dimensions, then uh, this would no longer be present, and there will be a finite piece, which is a function of this A. I'm cheating here a bit, because it turns out that in even dimensions, you guess what? There is a log. And in odd dimensions, there is, a real, there is really a finite piece. So this FA, I'll make a small, small table. If D is odd, which corresponds to even space-time dimensions, in fact, there is a log of lambda UV with some coefficient that I'll call gothic A, for reasons that will be clear soon. And when D is even, it's actually finite. So FA. This is gothic A, which is a function of A, and this is some constant as a function of A. So these quantities, <coughs> if the theory is conformal, so if the vacuum describes the vacuum of some conformal field theory, these quantities, gothic A, A, and FA, are properties of the continuum theory. As I've explained, if you have a cutoff in a conformal filter, you can do nothing with this cutoff besides rescaling it. <coughs> rescaling the cutoff, you can never contaminate the coefficient gothic A, A, or the finite part, finite part A. You can only change the prefactors in front of these power divergences. So power divergences can be removed unambiguously. And these guys are then associated to some entanglement entropy in the continuum. So there is meaning to the entanglement entropy in continuum quantum filtering. This is the main message, which is pretty, pretty striking. Yes? Sorry, what do you mean by the length of the 
So this is, I, nobody, nobody knows what exactly the formula, but it's some length scale associated with the boundary uh, raised to some power. People know that the leading divergence is the area, and people know that there is a finite part or a log part, which are universal, but I mean, this, these divergences are, uh, I don't know if there is a closed formula for, for these divergences. There should probably be some formula. You could probably fix it by demanding diff invariance or some nice invariance as a function of this contour. Maybe you can do something along these directions, but I didn't see that done yet. Yes? Well, uh, usually the expansion is in lambda squared, so this is what turns out to be true in examples, also in the lattice examples that people studied. <coughs> I think that it should follow from the following simple fact, that uh, if you introduce some fiducial metric into the system, then uh, the divergences would have to be some local counter term, because in quantum field theory, divergences are always associated to local counter terms. Yes? Uh, and if you introduce some... Uh, metric into the system, you'd have to write some uh, local counter term, which is diff invariant, which is a diff invariant functional of the metric, or the there is also extrinsic curvature, of course. If you're in d dimensions, there will be extrinsic curvature, so you'd have to write something which is local. And once you write something which is local, then you're guaranteed that the expansion is in even powers of lambda. I think something like that could, could be done. Yes, that's right. You need to assume some... Yeah, you could... Yeah, that's right. Uh, <coughs> yes. I see. Yes. Uh, for regular contours, maybe. Okay, uh, so that's the state of the art. Uh, the, the, striking, the striking conclusion is that there is meaning to the continuum, in the continuum to the entanglement entropy. And that somehow encodes information about the, vacuum stru the structure of the vacuum in quantum field theory, which is pretty important. So I'm really just tracing over the vacuum, and that encodes some information about the vacuum of the theory in flat space, which is important. It's a probe of the vacuum. <clears throat> People have even proposed how to calculate this entanglement entropy in ADS-CFT. So in ADS-CFT, all you need to do is to imagine that there is some uh, now orthogonal direction, another, well, a radial direction which pops out of the quantum field theory. And people have said that uh, uh, you should now uh, extend this surface into something whose boundary in this fifth dim five dimensional theory or D plus, D plus two dimensional theory is uh, this, uh, this object on the boundary and you calculate the minimal area. You just make minim you minimize over the area of this object that sticks into A on the boundary and you get the entanglement entropy. You remove divergences, of course, and you get the entanglement entropy, the finite part of the entanglement entropy. That proposal is under debate, but uh, there, are some, there are some consistency checks and there are some suspicious part about it, parts about it. The formula, I should want say one thing, that this proposal says, so you minimize of the, over the area in this fifth dimensional direct, in this fifth dimension, or over the whole ADS space, and then uh, F, F is, is claimed to satisfy the following equality. F is the minimal area that you found a, over 4G. Which is a fascinating formula. This, okay. So you minimize over the area in, in ADS, you divide by 4G Newton, famous Bekenstein Hawking formula, just in a different in a different context. And this is claimed to be FA after you regularize both sides. So you just power divergences so you can remove them, yes. You could also do this in momentum space. Yes, you can do entanglement entropy in momentum space. That's a very interesting problem. However, I think it's, I thought about it a bit. I think it's ill-defined. I think in momentum space, this, this, this thing is just not a good question to ask. Because in momentum space, interactions uh, involve all momenta. Every single term in quantum field theory, like a potential term, when you integrate over momenta, it involves basically all momenta. So, well, this thing has some kind of regularity because all the interactions are I either ultra-local or just nearest neighbors. So it clearly makes sense. But in momentum space, I think it may be more subtle to classify the divergences. It's not clear to me what kind of divergences would, do, would there be in momentum space if you try to study entanglement entropy in momentum space. It sounds like a least, somewhat less well-defined object. But from the other hand, also, a free theory vanishes, but it's a very simple <coughs> free theory, right? So yes. 
That's right. So there are arguments in, in both, supporting both points of view. I think it's not, yeah, it's hard to say something concrete about it at this point. Uh, well, in free, I'm not even sure about this argument of free theory. I don't see why, but anyway, we can discuss it later. Yes. This is a conjecture. People have, so you want to calculate this entanglement entropy. However, I strongly implore you to try to calculate it even in free field theory. I really implore you to try and calculate it in free field theory and you'll see that you absolutely cannot. It's way too complicated, even the free field theory. You can try to put the lattice and do it, but it's way, way too complicated. Nobody even knows how to do it in free field theory for an arbitrary contour. People just know how to do it for a circular contour. So people instead said, said, said that, okay, maybe in ADS-CFT you can calculate it in some way. And there was a guess, uh, a guess which says that you should minimize some volume in five dimensions, which ends on this, uh, on this, uh, on, on the boundary, which ends in the boundary ends on this uh, contour. It's a guess. And then they divided by 4G for some reason. And this kind of proposal passes some consistency checks, which I may, I may tell you about later if you want. But it passes some simple consistency checks. Hmm? Yeah, the, this 4G is important. I'll tell you why maybe, uh, just uh, to close this gap. Uh, so somehow this entanglement entropy knows about anomalies. Uh, and you can prove, as I'll explain later, that the coefficient of this log in some cases is a famous anomaly. So this normalization is important to reproduce the correct anomaly in five dimensions. So people have checked that the anomalies match if you normalize it with 4G Newton. Yes, Nima? You can also just divide the space in half, right? Oh yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's another thing you can do. And, and in fact, dividing the space by a half is something which uh, axiomatic filterists studied in the last, uh, well, they studied for many years, I think, and there's something extremely nice about it, which I'll tell you, even though that might not be understood about every, by everybody. So you suppose you divide the space by a half, and you study the entanglement entropy of these guys. So you could ask, what is the density matrix? Density matrix for this space. And there is an extremely, extremely simple answer. In general, nobody knows what's the density matrix, nobody knows what's the entropy, but in this case, there is a very nice argument that tells you exactly what's the answer without any calculation. So the way you would do that in a pass integral language is that you would do the pass integral over the states here. Well, to calculate the density matrix in the remaining space, you would fix some boundary conditions at uh, x equals epsilon, some boundary conditions at x equals minus epsilon, and this would define the density matrix uh, with, you know, with indices whatever field configuration you have at minus epsilon, whatever field configuration you have at plus epsilon. So you realize what kind of complicated pass integral you've got to do. You, have, you trace over the fields here, but you fix the boundary conditions here at plus and minus epsilon, and then you calculate the density matrix. By, it's basically an orbifold. It's like inserting a twist field at the origin. However, in this case, there is an extremely beautiful argument which says that boost, uh, sorry, rotation transformations, they basically do that. This is what the rotation does. Yeah, so rho is just given by the exponent of the rotation generator on the Hilbert space. But, but I was just wondering if, if there's anything nice about the analog of that. Uh, so so this is, it's, it's, the, it's the Riddler thermal density matrix of the... Of it's the Milne, the Milne kind of thing. It's like, it's like the Milne kind of thing where you have, a, where the boost generates the spectrum. But, but I'm asking, is there anything nice about the analog of that? <laughs> Yes, in conformal field theory, in conformal field theory, you can prove that this is a, in two dimensions, this is C. It's an interval, it's in semi-infinite interval, but you can prove that the coefficient of the log is C, and in four dimensions, you can prove that it's A. <coughs> yes, yes, well, I, don't, I won't discuss the Rainy entropies here. But yeah, this is a special case where you have this semi-infinite semi space where you can actually write the, row, the density matrix in terms of one generator that you already know. And you can, well, this is kind of useful because it shows that in some cases the, row, the density matrix derives from a local Hamiltonian, which is highly non-trivial. In general, there is no way to take, the log of the density matrix is not a local Hamiltonian. But when it's a semi-infinite interval, it turns out to be a local Hamiltonian, which is very similar to this Milne kind of quantization where you, where you choose the boost to be your time. Okay. Uh, and in three dimensions, is it that? Yes. <laughs> so that's a good. I mean, so this is another, so that is the literally. 
I'll, I'll now explain why this is true. Okay, I'll now explain what happens if you choose a special A, which is already what Nima has. So now I'll study entanglement entropy, where instead of this gener generic contour, I'll tell you what happens when A is a circle. Okay, so now A is assumed to be just a circle uh, of any radius. I'm discussing any conformal field theory. I'm discussing a conformal field theory, so it doesn't depend on the radius except for possible logarithms in even dimensions associated to some anomalies, and uh, it would be radius independent in odd dimensions. So how do we calculate uh, the density matrix for this guy? If you did the path integral, that would be really gruesome. It, you'd have to divide this, you'd have to calculate the path integral with in some spherical coordinates, with some funny boundary conditions. It's, it's completely intractable. I don't, I don't even think you can do it directly for a massive field. A massive free field. So that's intractable, but in a conformal field theory, you can make a conformal transformation. So you can make a conformal transformation in, in field theory to make a circle align. So there is a conformal transformation which takes this space to a semi infinite space sitting to the right of some line by conformal transformation. And in this case, there is a theorem that was proved by axiomatic field theorists or by the simple argument that I gave you with the, with the rotation. So there are two arguments. One is a very hardcore proof in axiomatic quantum field theory, and the other is using this nice argument with the rotation, uh, that, that in this case, the density matrix is an exponent of the rotation generator. So we know what is the density matrix for a half space, and by a conformal transformation, we can now calculate the density matrix in the sphere. The density matrix in the sphere, so a, one has to study, so this is a time equals to zero, right? So one has to study now the null rays that emanate from it, and one has to study the space of all the points, so now I'm also introducing time. So one has this uh, a kind, well, the projection, the projection of which, the, one has some space, the projection of which looks like this rectangular. Well, this, this is not a good drawing. So you have, basically what I'm trying to draw is that you have a circle at time equals to zero, and now I'm introducing time, which comes out of the blackboard, and that, and that gives you something like that. Uh, you have all the points which are connected by light-like rays only from points in the circle at time equals to zero, okay? Now, what you find by transforming, uh, by doing a conformal transformation uh, of this rotation generator is that uh, the density matrix for this half circ for this circle is also given by a local Hamiltonian. That's guaranteed because you just did the conformal transformation for the rotation operator. And it's something like, again, this Milne boost. You get some, some, you get some generator that takes in this rectangular, finite rectangular in space-time, uh, which leaves you in the rectangular, of course, and it generates, a, well, it, it, it generates this density matrix, and you can formally calculate the entropy by taking rho log rho. So this uh, kind of conformal transformation argument allows you to, in principle, determine the fact, determine, uh, determine the, the answer to a very non-trivial question, which is, what is the density matrix of this circle? And it turns out that it's a local, it's the exponent of a local operator, which generates, which generates some conformal killings vector in this space, which completes the circle in the direction of the time. Okay. So one can write down explicit formula, formula for all of that, which I'm uh, not going to bother with, but uh, it can be done. You can do these conformal transformations and you can follow all the details. And now there is one more step, uh, which is again some uh, somewhat complicated conformal transformation, but you can imagine that that's true. You can now, so now you have this nice system where you have a circle and you have all the points which are, which are connected to the circle by light-like rays and not connected to any other point at t equals to zero. And now you can do another conformal transformation that just acts on this diamond. So now this conformal transformation will act on this generalized diamond and it will send it to a sphere, a d-dimensional sphere. Okay, so by doing another conformal transformation, you can actually prove 
that the calculating the entropy density in this diamond is the same as calculating the partition function of the theory on the D-sphere. Are you sending the boundary? Yes. You just make the diamond round, and then uh, when you trace over this generator, it's the same as doing the pass integral. One can prove that. I mean, there's. Yes. You can make, it turns out this diamond is conformally equivalent to the sphere. This uh, diamond, when you look at it, isolated from everything else. Of course, there is no interpretation on the sphere for the general density matrix. There is no natural notion of general density matrix. But the entropy associated to this density matrix can be shown by this conformal transformation to, give it, to be given by the path integral over the sphere. And that completes the chain. Now you see that these entanglement entropies know about A, about F, and about C. In every number of dimensions, the von Neumann entropy of a half a space or alternatively of a circle is A, C, and F, respectively, in four, two, and three dimensions. Now, this sequence of conformal transformations is somewhat technical. I'll spare you the details, but I can give you the references where this is done. Yes? Well, you could cut the space in many different ways. Like, the choice of A and B, there is infinite number of possibilities. Yes. They are all independent numbers. Most of them are crappy. Like, most of them don't correspond to local, uh, a local Hamiltonian. But you can try to calculate them. Yes. No, no, I'm asking whether they give you extra information about the state. Oh, yeah, I think that they all, they all measure something about the vacuum. Yeah. Something. So, suppose they give you all of them. Would, yes. Would it be enough to fix the vacuum? It's uh, an infinite number of, uh, infinite number of numbers. <laughs> Probably over yeah, it's definitely, what you asked is definitely over-constrained because the complement has the same entropy as the original oh, space. Of course, of course. So I'm it's definitely <laughs> over-constrained. Uh, I don't know, what does it mean to fix the vacuum even? Right, it's a state, it's a state, right? A state in terms of the state. fundamental oscillators of the Lagrangian? You said it, well, it's not a free field theory. Right? Yes, yes. So I mean, I don't know Some wave function of, in terms yeah. of the fundamental oscillators. Yeah. Yes, I mean, I, I have no idea what to say. So, yeah, I have no idea what to say. Okay. But indeed, the, there is a whole industry of people trying to utilize this entanglement entropy to construct quantum field theory from first principles. I don't know if everybody is German, but I... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, uh, so there is a sequence of conformal transformations, which I... So I tried... Yes, it, it works in all dimensions. It's all the same, in all dimensions. All dimensions, it's true in all dimensions. The only difference is that you have to realize that the finite part at the correct continuum observable in even dimensions is the coefficient of the log. And then also the partition function has a log divergence. You see, it's very, I mean, this is the first consistency check of this proposal. Because in even dimensions, this has a log divergence and this has a log divergence. And in fact, for a circle, the coefficients match. Yes, one has to do a Euclidean, what one finds, what, yeah, yes, yes, one finds a de Sitter space. In fact, the, doing this conformal map, one finds a de Sitter space, and then one does a, a weak rotation. Yeah, there is some weak rotation involved. That's a, an important point. But indeed, there is some um, moral matching between what happens in even and odd D, where you get finite answers and logarithmically divergent answers. So... Yeah, there are many intermediate things. In fact, uh, people have worked out many, many intermediate steps in this construction, and I will now mention some of them. There are many other dualities that I did not mention yet. This is, I'll, I'll now write all the, possible, all the dualities that people know <coughs> up to date. These are all the quantities that give A, essentially, that you can obtain by doing this conformal transformation. So I'll now write all of them, and you can stare at that, and decide which one looks most promising. So uh, the partition function on the sphere, I'll start from the simple duality. So the partition function 
on SD. I've not proven for you, but I've somehow outlined the ingredients that go into the proof. I just outlined the ingredients, really. Uh, is the same as the entanglement entropy over uh, SD minus 2 in flat space. So this is in flat space, OK? So this is the first equality that one has to realize, that the partition function is the entanglement entropy in flat space over SD minus 2. No, D minus 1 in my notation. This is d plus 1. I messed up the notation, sorry. This is d plus 1, and this is d minus 1. Hmm? <coughs> S is the entropy, yes. So maybe I'll just write von Neumann. So this is the von Neumann entropy across a circle. So in three dimensions, that would be a circle. In four dimensions, that would be a two-sphere. So we have, the, we have the partition function of the sphere, which is equal to the von Neumann entropy on a circle, which is equal to the von Neumann entropy over a half space, a half space, which is what we started from. That's another point of view. And they all give A, F, and C in all dimensions. They correspond to each other in all dimensions. And then there is another, there is another sequence of dualities that one can obtain. Not all of them are known, but I'll just tell you what one finds. A, one thing that one finds is, uh, so the, the next step would be the following object. Uh, you, can, you find a, that you have to study a space, which looks like S1 times SD, OK? So one has another conformal transformation to a space of the form S1 times SD. That's also conformal equivalent to this diamond. And then one finds that uh, if you study the entanglement entropy across the lower hemisphere, it also gives A. So I'll just write it uh, succinctly as the von Neumann entropy across a uh, lower hemisphere. <coughs> so this is the entanglement entropy across the lower hemisphere. Sorry, this is not needed. This, you don't even need this to be. You just write R. So you can, there is another conformal map that I didn't tell you, which maps this whole bunch of things to R times SD. And you study the entanglement entropy across the lower hemisphere. And then there is another, another uh, duality, which is the thermal energy, the thermal energy, the thermal, uh, sorry, the entropy density, the entropy density. This is the ordinary uh, entropy density in a thermal system on a hyperbolic space of dimension D at temperature which is equal to a, so this is a hyperbolic space, so it has some curvature. Let's call this curvature a R. Then the temperature should be 2 pi over R. So, the temp so this is the entropy density at temperature 2 pi over R in a hyperbolic space of radius R. So the temperature is fixed in terms of the radius of the hyperbolic space. And this is the ordinary entropy density that you get in a thermal ensemble. So these are all equal things. They all give A in four dimensions, F in three dimensions, and C in two dimensions. You can get all of them by fancy conformal transformations from this diamond. What about one dimension? I, this is subtle. I don't, I don't want to discuss quantum mechanics. It's a, there is some subtlety with long-range interactions in quantum mechanics that jeopardizes the definition of some of these things. <coughs> so these are all the same thing. and. And uh, now you have to decide uh, what's look, I mean, what is the correct overarching principle that would allow you to come up eventually with a proof that RG flows are monotonic and they're universal by, you know, by relying on one of these principles and not alluding to the specific details of, the, of every single dimension, which is what sort of I've been doing. So to tease you a bit, I'll tell you one fact. Uh, Yes. So, uh, to summarize, so the first thing has a d plus one there, so it doesn't change the oddness of the dimension. So to relate even uh, to to odd, where what are the options? So in odd, this is true for every dimension. No, but d plus one if it relates it to d minus one. No, this is the full von Neumann entropy in a d plus one dimensional quantum field theory across a space-like sphere of d minus one dimensions. So in three dimensions, that would be the entanglement entropy across the circle. In four dimensions, across the sphere. And in one dimension, across, it would be an interval. Two points, sorry. 
In one dimensions, it would be just the, the, the yeah, von Neumann entropy of two points. Yes. So the, 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 this formula, formula are true in any dimension. It's just that some of, sometimes there are log divergences and sometimes they are finite after you remove the power divergences. And then it, this whole thing matches. Uh, OK, now there is one fact uh, which is illuminating. And this is known from in information theory as a strong subadditivity. So this is a theorem in information theory, uh, which is very illuminating. And it has been already used in particle physics in a way that I'll just outline for you. So again, consider this uh, space A with complementary space B in any number of dimensions at uh, time equals to 0. One can prove, uh, basically taking the lattice limit of the field theory and using this inequality which holds in information theory, one can prove that SA, where this is the von Neumann entropy of A, plus, sorry, this is a bad notation, this is AB, and then we have some another guy, C. So I take, so I divide, I have in the space A, I have C, and I have B, and these are some different regions in the space. So we have SA plus S, and I'll just change the notation a bit, sorry, a bit further to conform to the notes. So we have SA plus SB. What does it mean, SA and SB? SA means that you forget about everything else. You just focus on the region A. You do pass integral over the complementary of A. So SA plus SB has been proven in information theory in the analog of the, the discrete version of this thing to be bigger than SAB plus SA union B. A intersect B and A union B. So each of these objects is well-defined. You just remove everything besides what sits in the argument, and then you calculate the entanglement entropy. So this is called the strong subadditivity. This is a fundamental inequality in information theory. And in fact, this, information, this von Neumann entropy satisfies a sequen, an infinite sequence of inequalities. And one can prove that all of them stem from this basic inequality. So this is the strongest inequality, in some sense, that the entanglement entropy satisfies. This inequality in quantum field theory is slightly subtle because S, strictly speaking, diverges. And the divergence scales like the volume, like the, the volume of the boundary of each of these guys. So this inequality is really not very interesting. It's something about these volumes. But you can define something which is called mutual entropy in information theory, where you subtract spaces which have uh, the same volume, kind of. And then you can somehow write inequalities like that for the finite part. So even though this inequality itself is including the divergent part, there is a wise trick which is called a mutual. So I'll just tell you what it is. So what is the mutual entropy? So this fundamental inequality is fine, but one can define also something which is called the mutual entropy. And the mutual entropy depends now, uh, its argument is uh, two regions of space-time, A and B. And one assumes, just for simplicity, that they do not intersect. So one can define something which information theory is called the mutual entropy, and it's defined by SA plus SB minus SA intersect B. So I is a good object in quantum field theory now. Why? Because the, the, if A and B do not intersect. So the arguments of I are two spaces, two sets, which do not intersect. You can generalize I to spaces which intersect. So A intersect B is the, the empty set. S, a, sorry, S union B. So you can prove that this object is free of divergences, even in quantum field theory. So the entanglement entropy itself is a bit crappy because it has these power divergences. But the mutual information is completely finite. It's like NEMA's uh, ratios of amplitudes. It's completely finite. It's almost like the ratio of two, of two guys. It's a completely finite observable in quantum field theory that depends on any two uh, sets which do not intersect. Okay? So it's the sum of the entropies minus the sum of the entropy of the union guy. And that manifestly cancels all the divergences because all the divergences are local. They're associated to the contour. So if these guys do not intersect, it cancels all the, the area divergence and all the subletting divergences too. So this is a completely finite object in quantum field theory. And then uh, by using this inequality again and again and again in some mysterious ways, you can write inequalities for this i. And eventually, you can even write an inequality uh, for something like the A entropy or the C entropy in some cases. So 
So I is a, well, is a good object in quantum field theory, and using this inequality, you can write inequalities for I. That's what I'm saying. Now, one fact uh, which is uh, there to tease you, uh, I don't know how general it is, is that you can take this subadditivity constraint, and you can take this mutual information, and you can study it in two-dimensional quantum field theory. Two dimensions is simple because space like slice is just a line, and the geometry is very simple. There is nothing beyond intervals and unions of intervals. So you, have, you just have intervals, unions of intervals, and it's quite simple. In two dimensions, and this is something I'll give the reference because this is not a very well-known paper. A few years ago, uh, Cassini and Huerta, this is the only reference I've given in all the talks, but I think this is not very well-known, and it's a good paper. So there is a paper, a paper about two dimensions by Cassini and Huerta from uh, Argentina, where they started from two-dimensional systems, so where the space like slice is just a line, and they studied entanglement entropy across in intervals, unions of intervals, intersections of intervals, and they, of course, used this inequality again and again and again. They used the mutual information, and they managed to prove the zoomologic of C theorem in this way. The only input they used is that what I told you, when you have a, that you have a log, and in some favorable, favorable circumstances, the coefficient of the log is C, like in this half space example. So they basically only used the fact that if you looked at a half space, at a half of a space in two dimensions, uh, the coefficient of the log would be C by the argument that I've given you with all these conformal transformations. So using the fact that for a half a space it's just C, they managed to prove by using conformal transformations and these subadditivity inequalities, they considered massive theories, and they managed to prove that C U V is bigger than C infrared. It's a proof of the logic of theorem that does not have any energy momentum tensor in it. It's purely in terms of information theory. And that's that's a that I think bodes well for the future so of the this kind of idea. Positive probabilities here or hmm? how does the input of unitarity enter? Uh, yes, the input of unitarity enters in the fact uh, that the density matrix is positive definite. That's the, that's the only place where they used it. That's the absolute only place where they used it, that the, that the density matrix is positive definite. So basically, you, you can read their paper, but they started, well, I've given you all the background you need basically to read what they've done. And they started from half a space and then used conformal transformations and this inequality again and again and again, and they proved the logic of theorem. So nobody knows how to generalize their argument to higher dimensions. For example, to three dimensions, where we don't have a proof, because the geometry of three dimensions doesn't quite allow to do what they've done, if you look at the details. But I think it bodes well for the future. It's suspicious. And so that's all. No, it's uh, not. It's not terribly hard. Basically, uh, basically, in, in two dimensions, uh, you can. The first thing you know is that for a half a space, it's a uh, C. Then uh, there is some uh, way of proving that even if you have an interval of length L. Uh, then uh, the coefficient of the log is C times the log of L over the, times the cutoff, over the cutoff. So you can prove that for finite intervals in two dimensions, there is a log of the lens and, uh, with the UV cutoff and the coefficient is C. Now what these guys did is uh, to study the mutual information having two intervals that in general intersect. And then they so they looked at uh, these diamonds that I told you about. And there are many diamonds. There are the diamonds that are associated to this interval, the diamonds associated to this interval. So they looked at the diamonds associated to these different intervals. And what they said is that the miracle of two dimensions is that the intersection of two diamonds like that is another diamond. So uh, they could prove inequalities between C associated uh, to long intervals and short intervals, basically. Using the fact that the intersection between these diamonds is another diamond sitting here. And well, they had something a bit more elaborated. Basically, the idea is that because of these intersections of diamonds is another diamond, they managed to prove that if you increase 
uh, L. So this is for a conformal field theory, of course. For a non-conformal field theory, uh, C becomes a function of the RG scale, if you want, of the distance. So what you want to prove, so this is some extension of the logic of C to an RG flow, which of course coincides at very long and short distances with C, but it's some extension. So they managed to prove that uh, by intersecting diamonds and using conformal transformations in two dimensions that C is a monotonic decreasing function uh, from short intervals to long intervals. When you have a very long interval, so that's another fact which is very, which is very important, so if you have a massive theory, not a conformal theory, and you have a very large space, the entanglement entropy approaches the entanglement entropy of the conformal field theory of the macrophysics. That's because all the massive degrees of freedom have a very short length scale to propagate, and they don't create any entanglement entropy. So you, you're only sensitive to the massless, particle when you, massless particles when you go to long distances. On the other hand, when you're at short distances, you know only about the UV physics somehow. So they use this physical input <coughs> to prove that for long intervals, the coefficient of the log is smaller than for short intervals by intersecting diamonds and using this inequality again and again. Basically, I mean, that's the gist of the argument. Yes, yes. C decreases as you increase the interval. Yes. Yes. Yeah, uh, not to the nature, but there is one insight which is independent of this construction. Uh, you can tinker with these coefficients. So the coefficient, tin yeah, you can tinker with these coefficients just by hand. You s so A gives you 1 plus 11 over 2 plus 62. You can, say, you can say, okay, I don't like it. I'll put instead of 62, 61. And then it's very easy to construct counterexamples. So it's really important that it is 62. You can construct counterexamples with 63. You can construct counterexamples with 61. 62 is important. You can't really tinker with the coefficients, but uh, I don't have a physical interpretation of 62. It's a bus integral, you know, it's the entanglement entropy of a gauge field. So if you take a gauge field in four dimensions, it turns out that the entanglement entropy of a gauge field in a circle is 62 times larger than of a scalar, basically. Yes, it's very interesting. So that, uh, so that's, uh, so that, that somewhat explains why it's not your naive thing. Of, uh, of yeah, it's the thermal energy in a hyperbolic space. Because the hamilton is a boost, so it yeah. well, uh, knows about the spin. It's, it's, the the thermal, yeah. it's the entropy density in a hyperbolic space, not in flat space, where the coefficients are more funny than in flat space. I don't know. Yes, the fact that there is log in even dimensions for the entanglement entropy is also a funny fact that uh, begs for an explanation. But it was found numerically and uh, in other ways, in direct ways. Yes? I have some confusion about the two-dimensional case. Yesterday you claimed that C, the common points, is the limit with respect to the log of the, the radius of the log of the condition function. Yes. And today you say that it's also the condition function in S2. Yesterday you said that you no, no, I, when I said, when I wrote this equality equals to partition function, I meant the derivative of the partition function with respect to the log. That's what I actually meant. That there, there is no, uh, you know, no that's right. Proof. This proof is not about the, this proof, so this equality between this huge duality chain that I wrote is for CFTs. What one has to choose when one discusses a massive theory is which frame he likes most, and then try to prove something, which in the end would imply something about the whole set. So what these guys, Cassini and Huerta, did is they decided that entanglement entropy is their runner, and they proved something with entanglement entropy. They proved an inequality, which then implies something about flat space physics and the sphere. But nobody knows how to start from the sphere and prove that the massive theory leads to a monotonic behavior. That might not be even true. Here there is a strict monotonic behavior of something. On the sphere, there, it might not be even true that there is a strict monotonic behavior of anything. Yes. No, 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 no. I, it's one of the things that uh, on my list. <laughs> it's not understood. 
Yeah, basically the question is where, how to understand this entanglement entropy for Chern-Simons theory. You can, start, you can try to study Chern-Simons theory. I mean, that could be an interesting problem in mathematical physics, to try to solve the entanglement entropy of Chern-Simons theory with a general contour that defines the entangling surface. And to find the answer for a general contour, and there might, there might be some interesting stuff going on, but nobody did that. So, I don't know.